Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be rejoined today by David Heron, who is the founder of The Quorum. It's an incredibly useful uh, website for, you know, amateur and, and professional movie watchers alike to figure out uh, what is going on in the world of box office tracking. A very, uh, it's a, it's a, as I was just saying to David, it's a unique and useful resource, a rare thing in uh, my world. David, thank you for being back on the show. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Sonny. Appreciate being back. It's great to be here. So uh, the reason I have you on the show today is because there's a new study out uh, that was co-authored by by you guys at the Quorum and the Cinema Foundation, um, which is uh, the, a, a project of the National Association of Theater of, of Theater Owners, NATO, the other NATO, as I like to call it. Um, uh, and uh, there, it's got lo- we got lots of interesting data on this, but I want to jump all the way to the end of the 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 PDF that you guys attached to this thing, because the, the last slide on, on this uh, was the most interesting to me um, in it. Uh, it says that the uh, of the theater growers who are surveyed, 42 percent say that they have become more interested and excited about going to the movies in recent months. And that's three times high, three times higher than the responses to the same question from last year. Um, you track this stuff all the time. I mean, this is, again, what you guys do at the forum. What have you uh, what has changed for these moviegoers? What have you seen change over the, the last year or so? Well, by the way, I love this statistic. I mean, anybody who's a fan of theatrical loves the statistic. Um, I, the biggest change that we're seeing is that a lot of the supply chain issues that really stymied the box office in 2022 have gone away. And what I mean by that is last year there were very large pockets across the calendar, the release calendar, where there simply weren't any movies. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the pandemic caused delays, that caused production delays, which caused uh, films to get pushed. And there simply wasn't enough content. And, you know, it's really hard for an industry to recover, especially when it's so content-based, when there just isn't enough stuff for people to see. So that's beginning. Those are, those are sort of, those supply chain issues are sort of working themselves out. And we can just see that right now in the fact that each weekend we're getting two, three, four new movies each week. This weekend we've got four. Um, We're seeing a wider variety of movies. We're seeing a wider variety of movies succeed at the box office. And so, uh, you know, if you give them content, they'll show up. So I think that's really the, that's really the biggest change that we've seen. But on top of that, you know, going to the movies is, is, has a certain muscle memory to it, right? So People who were sitting on the sidelines over the past two years for whatever reasons, because they were nervous about going or they forgot about it. Once they go back to the theaters for the first time, they tend to kind of remember what it is they love about it. Right. And then that just sort of builds on itself and then people feel more comfortable about going back. So I think we're beginning to see all of those things come together and create the sense that, yeah, I'm more interested. I'm more excited. And that's wonderful for theatrical. I, one thing that uh, I, I hear from lots of people, I've mentioned this on the show before, but one thing I hear from lots of folks in the world of uh, theatrical exhibition is that, you know, when folks went back for Top Gun Maverick, uh, that is kind of what sparked a lot of interest in going back to the theaters. You know, they saw the trailer for Elvis. We're like, oh, yeah, I, I that looks fun. I, I'll go see Elvis. Um, is Did we did you do you think there was some similar effect with Avatar The Way of Water, which is, I mean, a huge, huge box office hit, uh, obviously. You know, we can debate the cultural impact of Avatar till the cows come home. But like the, the simple fact of the matter is tons of people went to go see it. Um, and uh, I wonder if that has kind of sparked some of that return in the same way that Top Gun Maverick did. Yeah, well, it's all it's all cumulative, right? It's all. But, but to me, the movies, the movies that I look at that being most impactful in terms of changing behaviors are movies like Where the Crawdads Sing. Because that's a movie that really targets an audience that was most reluctant to come back to theaters. And so when we get, you know, study after study has shown that women over 35 have been the most reluctant. They're the ones who've been sitting on the sidelines the longest. And so when I see a movie like Crow Dad succeed, um, that's, the, that's what gets me really, really excited. When we see a movie like Super Mario, what's happening with Super Mario is so unbelievable that um, that to me is even more exciting than what happened with Avatar. Because Super Mario Brothers is certainly a known IP, but it's not a sequel, right? It doesn't have that same level of built-in audience. We're very clearly getting repeat viewership for this movie. And we're getting a, a wide swath of, of viewers going to see this movie. That's the stuff that I love to see. Like Avatar, um, you would expect it to do what it's doing. And, and yes, it's great. 
see there's this there's this again there's a sort of cumulative effect right because when you go see a movie like avatar and you get you get millions and millions of people seeing it you're seeing the trailers for the movies that are coming out three months down the road so it does build on itself but i'm always really looking at those movies that are kind of attracting um sort of a marginalized audience and and succeeding and those are the ones that make me the happiest I will say, as a family man with kids uh, who enjoys going to the movies, I have felt exceptionally marginalized uh, this this last six <laughs> months or so. I mean, the the last movie I could take my kids to was Puss in Boots. That was it came out four months ago. I mean, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy what, did, what, what happened. Did you take them to Super Mario? I took. Yeah, I did. I did. We went to we went to Super Mario Brothers this week uh, during during the week, and it was uh, they the fun time. Everybody everybody had a good time. Kids love kids love going there, eating the popcorn. Uh, you know, having having fun at the movies. So, I think the the last area of of the box office that we really want to watch to see recover is kind of the high end independent films, right? Because they really they really struggled theatrically towards the end of the year, and you know, movies like Tar and The Fablemans, and you know, A twenty four has really been the only studio that's kind of figured it out. But they have this movie, Bo is Afraid, which did enormous enormous numbers in four screens last weekend, and it's opening wider this week, and. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see if sort of a, a, a mature audience that looks for these types of movies is going to show up because they've been kind of the last ones. Yeah, um, that's for sure. I, so let's I, I do want to talk about the quorum just a little bit here, because it is, uh, yeah. as I said, it's great. It's a it's a great resource if you are trying to figure out what people are actually uh, looking to see. It's a gr- it's a good way to get out of my own bubble. That's really how I look <laughs> at this, because, you know, I, I, I exist on Twitter. I'm a creature of Twitter. I'm constantly there so like i and i and i go see all my movies at the alamo draft house which creates two very distinct bubbles i get i get a very distinct set of trailers and i get a very distinct form of the conversation um so it's kind of nice to i like for instance bo is afraid i went and looked up the numbers on that um and i was a little bit surprised to see that they were lower than i thought they would be um but i am i am also curious to see how it plays with audiences now that there are some there's some buzz about it and some numbers out there. Uh, w- what have you seen in terms of um, awareness of movies and desire to go see movies over the last quarter or six months or so? Well, I think the biggest difference that we're seeing is a wider variety of movies getting higher levels of awareness and interest. Right. So, you know, last year, you know, we, we saw that it was mostly the tent poles and mostly you know, the, the Marvel and the DC movies that were scoring really well on on, on the quorum. And by the way, just sort of like to, to, to take a beat here, you know, basically what the quorum does is we go out and we pull, um, you know, a few thousand people each week and we ask them a series of questions. But the two big questions are, what upcoming movies are you aware of and what upcoming movies are you interested in? And, and, and those two metrics in combination kind of really reveal the health of a movie's marketing campaign and whether or not it's really resonating with its core audience. And, and, the biggest difference that we're seeing now is really just, again, that variety, right? So there was a period in February and March when we were, the, the, the tracking on the quorum showed movies like John Wick and Creed and Scream and, um, and Super Mario Brothers. And not a single one of them had a superhero in them. Not a single one of them were from Marvel and from DC. And that's, that's really, really encouraging. Uh, so that's been, been the biggest change is that people are beginning to sort of tap into these movies that kind of live outside the $200 million budget range. Uh, I, one more nuts and bolts question, just since you since you bring it up it, in, in the polling, when you are asking for awareness, are you asking for people? Uh, are you asking unawaited, uh, unaided awareness? Right. Are you are you saying what are some movies <laughs> you know are coming out soon and ask them to well, list we, them? Or do you give them a list of movies and say, which are you aware of? Well, we do both. But what you see on the website is uh, is not unaided. It's it's aided. So we 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 give them um, a log line and we give them some artwork. In most cases, it's a poster. Um, and so you know the, the unaided, unaided awareness is a is a highly predictive metric. But the numbers are incredibly small. So for example, in our fielding last week, Guardians of the Galaxy, a big movie that's opening in a few weeks, had an unaided awareness of five percent, meaning that only five percent of the people that we polled could mention the fact that there was this movie called Guardians of the Galaxy that was coming out. Uh, and, and most of the movies had zero. So, um, so that's, that's why we really wrote on the website, we put, we put total awareness on there because it, 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 it's a little more, you can kind of see that the divisions between the movies a little bit more. It's not super interesting if, if 70% yeah. of the movies on the website have got a, a score of zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, and that's hard. And it's also not really how people 
decide to go see the movies, right? I mean, people look at showtimes, right? They look at a they look at a box office uh, marquee or they look at the Fandango web page and they're like, this is what I want to see. This is what I want to see. Yeah, that's true. Although, you know, un- unaided is a really interesting metric um, because there's this theory that if you can if you can mention a movie off the top of your head without being prompted, chances are you probably want to go see it. So when we look at unaided, um, you know, a lot of the movies that are opening over the next six or seven weeks may have sort of zero unaided. But then you can look at a movie like Wonka, which is coming out at Christmas time, which has got like one or two percent unaided or even Barbie, which is opening in July, June or July, that has you know, 4% unaided. And what that tells you is that these long lead campaigns are already beginning to register and work a little bit. So to see like little green shoots of, of unaided awareness for movies that are several weeks or even months out is very, very encouraging. So this, uh, once again, this just more proof that uh, the the Barbie movie is coming out July 21st opposite of Oppenheimer is going yes. to be very, very disappointing, possibly for people who are uh, big Nolan heads out there. Just uh, that there's a, it's going to be tough. Well, I can talk a lot. About, so Barbie's a really interesting one because we see very high awareness, but the interest numbers are actually quite low on the movie. Um, and you know, when we look at awareness and we and we look at interest, we want them to kind of be in balance, right? We want people to be both aware of it and also be interested. And if there's an imbalance, there can be a problem. So if you've got, let's say, you've got low awareness and high interest. Well, that's not a bad situation to be in. That means that not a lot of people know about the movie, but the people who do know about it want to see it. That's great. You can always build awareness by sort of spending money um, down the road. If you've got high awareness and low interest, that means a lot of people know about it, but they don't necessarily want to see it. And that's that's the position that Barbie is in. Now, to be fair, um, you know, the Barbie campaign really picked up, started sort of in earnest about a week ago or about 10 days ago. And we're... St- it, it takes about 10 days or so or about two weeks to really measure the full impact of big campaign shift like that. So we're, we're still very closely watching Barbie to see if uh, those, if those interest numbers start to rise. And, and we're beginning to see a little bit of a climb in interest, but we won't really know the full impact of that for the next week, but did not start off at a great position. Interesting. That is interesting. All right. Uh, so let's, let's shift uh, back to this uh, uh, new uh, poll. It's real tons of really interesting little data nuggets. Um, we've got lots of stuff about value propositions and all that. Um, but why don't you why don't you tell us what uh, from your perspective the top line uh, figures are here on on uh, what you guys found and what audiences are looking for? Sure. So you know, so this the study kind of started. By the way, as you said, this was commissioned by the Cinema Foundation, and this the study really started with this idea of can we show using data that the value proposition of going to the movies is greater than other out-of-home entertainments. And, you know, I think that over the years, theatrical has been kind of attacked, and wrongly so, for um, being expensive, right? That ticket prices go up and, and premium format tickets are more expensive and concession prices go up. And the pushback has always been, well, it is really the most affordable uh, source of out, out-of-home entertainment. And we wanted to see if if the general public kind of felt the same way. So we, we looked at, at movie, going to a movie theater versus four other kind of out-of-home entertainments. And those are like going to a music concert, going to see a live theater like Broadway, a sporting event, going to an amusement park or water park. And what we found is that audiences kind of feel the same way that theatrical feels, which is, yes, they do understand that going to a movie costs less, right? In most cases, we asked people how much they would expect to pay, to pay just for one person, not for a family, just for an individual to go to a movie versus those other four types of events. And most people said that they expected to spend somewhere between $10 and $30. Most of them were in the $10 to $20 range for a movie ticket, ticket, whereas all of those other things they expected to spend more than $60. So right there, that tells us, okay, that the, that the movie-going people understand that, not even the movie-going people, the general public knows, understands that movies are really very affordable. But affordability doesn't translate into value, right? So the second step of this is to, okay, now we understand that people see that going to a movie is affordable, but does it provide greater value than those other forms of entertainment? And again, the results showed yes, that um, we saw this in a number of different ways. We saw it in forced choice, meaning if you could only do one thing with your money, what would you do? People chose going to the movie. Which of these events provides the greatest value? People said going to the movie. And so 
So that's, that's kind of at the macro level. At the macro level, we see that the value is there. The micro level, when we drill down, the second part of the study took a look at, well, what is it about the movie going experience itself that provides the greatest value? And that's where things get really, really very, very interesting. And we looked at things like, you know, concessions, and we looked at premium large format, and we looked at uh, sort of price sensitivity, and we looked at things like, do you go see a movie, you know, only on the weekends at night when the theaters are full, or do you take advantage of discount Tuesdays? And what we saw there is that it's really, going to the theater is not really a one-size-fits-all proposition for people, that there are some people who are going to pay a lot of money, and they're going to get all the concessions, and they're, going to, they're not going to share those concessions, and they're going, to, they're going to pay a premium price to see it on a large format screen. And you've got other people who are much more price sensitive, who are going to buy concessions only if they can share it with a family member or a friend, and they're not going to see premium large, large format, and they're going to go matinees, and they're going to go to you know, those Discount Tuesday showings, which is really wonderful because it kind of shows that a, a wide swath of people can enjoy movie going at different price points. Well, I mean, is this uh, is this polling data the sort of proof that uh, theater owners are looking for if they want to start, um, uh, I don't know, variable pricing, price discrimination? I mean, is this is this proof that it, it makes sense to to uh, monkey a little bit with individual ticket prices or uh, prices for individual movies or or not? Is that still something that is not really on on the table here? Well, so I, you know, this is a topic that I love. I love this topic of, of variable pricing. Um, now, that's a little bit outside the scope of this study, but there have been other studies that have been published, and the Quorum has done its own studies about, about um, sort of dynamic pricing. And what they usually show is that consumers don't really mind it, right? So there's, there's kind of variable pricing along three fronts. There is the variable pricing where you walk into a theater and there are two movies playing at 9 o'clock, and one of them is $8 and one of them is $12. And then you've got variable pricing within an individual theater, which is kind of what the AMC model, Mm -hmm. the sightline pricing where, you know, the front is less expensive, the back is less expensive, and the middle seats are more. And then you've got the third form, which is what Paramount did with 80 for Brady, where they kind of work with exhibition to make sure that all the ticket prices are the same as matinee prices in the evening. Um, And I think some of them are more successful than others. So, you know, the Paramount, the Paramount, uh, exercise with 80 for Brady was enormously successful. You know, if you remember, it opened against Night Shyamalan's movie, Knock at the Cabin, and everyone expected Knock at the Cabin to really win the weekend by a, by a wide margin. And it turned out that 80 for Brady actually sold more tickets opening weekend than Knock at the Cabin. Now, Knock at the Cabin grossed more because the ticket prices were higher. But 80 for Brady worked because 80 for Brady appealed to an older audience That does not rush out to theaters. It's an older audience that relies very much on word of mouth. It's an older audience, which is price sensitive. So if you can get that audience to come in at a discounted price and then have them evangelize the movie for you to all of our other friends, they will then come in in the subsequent weeks when the prices are are at the the normal higher rate. That's an experiment that worked. The the sightline pricing, I think, is to be determined. And while studies show that consumers don't necessarily mind paying more for a seat that's in the middle of a theater. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions about it, like how do you enforce it? And what happens if row W is one price and row V is another price and somebody decides, oh, you know what? I paid for the higher price, but I'm just going to sit, or I paid for the lower price. I'm just going to move up a row. Or, you know, again, if the theater is empty, if you just sort of move around into a different seat, those sort of questions are sort of unanswered at the moment. And, uh, and, and, and that, you know, that remains to be seen. Yeah. I, the, I, this is, this is super interesting to me because I have, uh, fairly strong feelings on the AMC plan, which I don't, I think is an interesting experiment, but puts such a burden on the actual employees of the theaters, um, yes. that it is, is I'm not sure that the squeeze is worth the juice, uh, to use a phrase. Um, but we'll see. Uh, and it's it is super interesting. I mean, the 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 interest, the experiment that I've been most interested to watch for personal reasons, in addition to professional reasons, uh, is the Tuesday discounts, which seem to have been a very big success at a number of different theaters. Um, and I will say just from experience, like uh, we're uh, on another podcast I do across the movie aisle. We're doing a live show um, at a draft house on a Tuesday. We're we're screening war games. We're going to tape an episode after. 
Tickets are only seven dollars, and that it's it's already half sold out, two thirds sold out a month out. Um, and I I was very excited for this because I'm like I can tell people to come see it, and it's just seven dollars. It's you know they're not they're not putting too much of their money on the line if it doesn't work out. Um, but it it that feels like a thing that is working for the theaters in general. Is it is or is it not? I mean. First of all, I'm so excited that you're screening War Games. I want to, I want to go see that. It's been years since I've seen that movie. Love that movie. Um, <laughs> it's going to be fun. I hope people, I, I hope people show up. Well, apparently they are. That's yeah. great that you've, you've oh. got so many tickets sold already. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, yes, people do take advantage of Discount Tuesdays. Discount Tuesdays have been around for a long time. Um, and I don't necessarily know if, if the entire film-going population is completely aware of the fact that it exists. But the people who do know that it exists take advantage of it. And, um, and again, I think it's, 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 it's really very, very smart of theatrical to do that because again, it, it really appeals to those people who are price sensitive and, 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 and can't necessarily afford to go see a movie at, you know, 12 to $18, depending on where you live. You know, our study showed that, um, uh, let me get you the exact number. I think it was 13% of people say that, um, that most of the time they buy a ticket on Tuesdays. That doesn't mean every time, that just means most of the time. But our study also showed that a wider, a wider number of people, closer to 40% of people, have dabbled in, in Tuesday discounts, um, which is wonderful. And, and, and that's, that's the kind of stuff that we want to see. So yeah, I think it does, I think that it does work having a wide range of ticket prices available. And for something like War Games, which is kind of, you know, sort of your repertory theater. I think it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. Yeah, I uh, this isn't really addressed in the study. It's it, it comes up very briefly in a discussion about um, concessions. But I, I'm curious what the effect of rewards programs and subscription style programs have been on uh, on attendance. I mean, if you if you have the data, if you don't, I, I'll, I'll move on here. But if 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 these are driving more people to the theater on a regular basis or what? Yeah, so it's actually we do have that data. It was not it, it was not part of the the final um, the final study, but we looked at it in the study, and we've also looked at it in studies before. That you know people do take advantage of rewards programs. Rewards programs for them, you know, in most cases, well, they they offer a lot of things. But one of the things that they definitely offer is um, free refills, right? So um, if you eat your popcorn or you finish your drinking, good refill. And what the study found is that a lot of people really take advantage of that. But the other thing that we also found it's very um, it's very sort of binary, right? We also see a lot of people who are not taking advantage of rewards programs at all. And so what we have continually said um, through the quorum is that, you know, these theater chains um, really have an opportunity to bring more of these people who are price sensitive into the theater by being a little bit more aggressive in their marketing of these rewards programs, because we see that people are taking advantage of them when they're aware of them. The problem is that not everybody is aware of them. So that's, that's a real that's a real growth opportunity for theaters is to continue to press on, you know, letting people know that these programs exist because they're great and people love them. Uh, one of uh, one of the things that there, there, there it feels like there's a contradiction here um, in the data and in just my lived experience talking to people going to theaters. One thing you hear a lot about is, you know, people people saying, well, going to the movies is expensive, right? Um, going to the movies is expensive. And I, I you know, I don't want. But then at the same time, they're always like, yes, I'm definitely going to see the new movie in IMAX. <laughs> I'm definitely going to see it in Dolby 3D, um, which, you know, again, that's like the most expensive way possible to see a movie. Now, it I, I will say, you know, from, from my POV, totally worth it. I like seeing movies in IMAX. I like going to the, the Dolby theaters. Um, but it does feel like there is kind of a there's there's a weird contradiction in consumer response and consumer behavior. Is there is there not? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's something that we saw in the study. So, for example, we saw that 30% of people in our study said that price is a big factor in the decision to go. Now, this is just a, this, this, the statistic that I just quoted is among people who, who are active theater goers. So 30% say it's a big factor, but they're still going. But then you can also look at the statistic that we have in our study about um, do you buy concessions? And we see that 96% of the people we studied say that they buy concessions either every time or sometimes. So you've got 30% who say the price is a factor, and yet almost everybody's buying concessions. <laughs> so I... you, you sort of like, well, well, that doesn't make sense, right? There's a <laughs> disconnect there. And I think what that sort of speaks to is, again, which parts of the film-going 
uh, of the film going journey do people place value on? And people gripe about the price of concessions, but they place enough value on it that they're willing to pay those prices to, to, to buy the food and the drinks. I, the, the number that was most surprising to me in this survey is the 60 percent of people who say they always buy concessions, 60 yes. percent who say they always buy concessions. And I I just find that fascinating. I will say my for my again, for my own personal experience, you know, uh, I used to go to the theaters uh, it, before I moved to a place with a draft house. I used to go to the theaters all the time, you know, two, three times a week, basically same as I do now. And I never got concessions. Never. I, I, I was a never concession person really? just because I like I, you know, not healthy, expensive. I was going to the theaters a lot, whatever. But now that I now that I, I have a draft house where the, the popcorn comes right to your seat, it's great. And I get concessions every time. I'm curious if there's been any if you guys see any change in behavior, depending on the style of theater, the, the theaters with the the dining in. Um, at the seats, the restaurant style dining, or uh, or if there's no if there's no real change or difference. Well, you know, one of the things that we looked at in the study was kind of these, these elevated food offerings or restaurant style foods, and um, we saw that about half the people we polled have taken advantage of that, have kind of purchased things like hamburgers or salads or what have you. And then, you know, among those. 50% of people who ordered it, we asked them whether or not they enjoyed it or thought it was a good experience. And we saw that, you know, for the most part, people liked the food. They felt that the food was good. And uh, almost all of them said that they would buy it again. So I think that that is really an area of focus for theatrical. You know, the theaters that are not doing it should maybe take a closer look at offering these things because, you know, the, the audiences do like them. But, you know, I think when, when it comes to the price of concessions, I think context is is super helpful, right? So like if I go, I'm in LA, if I go out on and, and get a cocktail at a bar, I'm probably gonna pay $16 at the low end, right? I might even pay 20 or $24. And, and that cocktail will last me, what, a half hour, 45 minutes. For $20 or $24, the price of a cocktail, I could get, you know, two large popcorns and two sodas at a theater. So, you know, when we think about the concessions, people gripe about the price, but the truth is that given the, the wide scope of, of entertainment offerings, are the price of concessions at, at a movie really that expensive relative to all of those other things? Um, so, I, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm surprised that you're surprised by that number because every time I go to a movie, I see everybody go right to concessions. I don't see a whole lot of people skipping the concession line. So I, I was not entirely surprised by those, res those results. Yeah, I know. I, this is just me, my own, again, my own personal bubble lived experience slight, slightly different than that. All right. Um, I, that was that was pretty much everything I wanted to ask. Uh, I, I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. What do you think folks should know about the state of theatrical, uh, this survey, what's going on at the quorum, anything? Um, it may be too early. And I, I know how sharp I am this morning. I don't know how sharp I was during this, but I feel like we covered I feel like we covered a lot. Um, you know, I think the only thing that I would say is that the summer box office looks really stacked and that's a great thing. And so all of the things that we're seeing in theatrical now, these, these sort of the, the success of movies that kind of live outside of the tentpole space. Um, imagine what it's going to look like this summer when the tent tentpole starts to return. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of reason to be enormously optimistic about theatrical. It's a wonderful time. It really feels like theatrical is back in a meaningful way. And, you know, we've got CinemaCon this week. So CinemaCon. CinemaCon. It's going to be very exciting. I know everyone is looking uh, forward to that. Well, David, thank you very much for being uh, back on the show. Really appreciate it. Getting you getting you early on the uh, the West Coast uh, to, to <laughs> yes. talk about this. So it's uh, but no, we're I thought I thought you were very sharp. I thought this was a very, very good and informative. Oh, good. Good. interview uh all right sorry so, listeners if i was <laughs> no it's great all right uh so uh thanks again david uh the site is the court just the quorum.com go there you, there's again if you are a uh, a box office nerd there's so much interesting data there to kind of look through and sift through and see what um audiences are looking forward to and what uh might might pop at the box office um so check it out uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark, and I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. We'll see you guys then. Mm -hmm.